so that you should stand in the early gospel. So we're going to the gospel today, the Feast of St. Mark Mary Alicante, which is here again in San Diego, Santee, and California here, and we will read only the gospel. So the Feast of St. Mark and Mary Alicante, taken from the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 11. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them to the little ones. Yea, Father, for so hath it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me by my Father, and no one knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither does anyone know the Father but the Son, and he to whom it shall please the Son to reveal him. Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. Take up my yoke upon you, and learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart. You shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is sweet, and my burden light. Bless the words of the days, holy God. And the Father, the Holy Ghost, men. Today, the feast of Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque, who gave us the great uh, devotion, the great uh, gift uh, for our times, one of the great weapons of our times to fight against Satan. And that is the understanding and the great devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. You know that we are human beings, and they say that we are not, we are supposed to be not attached, not attached. And yet, there are things that we need in order to get to God. We are attached to water, by which we receive the Holy Sacrament of Baptism. We are attached to bread, which is transformed and transubstantiated into the body and blood and soul of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're attached to stones and wood, which are constructed in order to make places for us to worship God. We're attached to clothing, which is used in the sacred worship of God and the holy vestments that the priest wears. So much so, in fact, that when, young, when a priest is consecrated a bishop, in the consecration form, in the actual form of the sacrament, the bishop who consecrates a young priest, a bishop, a new priest, a bishop, he says to him, may, the, may whatever these vestments, these clothing, these cloths, may what they signify drop down as dew into the heart of this priest. And may even the fullness of the ministry of the priesthood with the sacred vestments that Aaron wore. God designed vestments for Aaron. And the high priest of the New Testament wears these vestments. And so we wear these vestments, and that's clothing, that's a thing. And with this clothing, may we have whatever these holy vestments stand for, let them enter into the heart of this priest. Let them enter into his blood. So we human beings are not like unto the angels. The angels aim directly at God in his very essence. They are spiritual beings. But God did not say of the angels... Let us make the angels unto our own image and likeness. He simply made the essence of his divinity in an angel, the highest part of his divinity in an angel, but that's only one part of his divinity. There's another part of the divinity of God, and this is manifested by the beautiful world in which we live. And how many parts are there in this beautiful world? There's an infinite number of parts. And Lord Jesus Christ also, who said, don't be attached to things, cast off the things of this world, he is the same one that said, when I walk through a field, when the Son of Man walks through a field, he is not going to step upon the broken reeds, and he is not going to extinguish the smoking flax, the little bitty reeds of sugar cane, little reeds that are, were made into temporary pipes that the shepherds used to play flute. They made a homemade flute, and every time they play a few notes, it would break, and they would throw it on the ground. And they would break again and would throw it on the ground. So that eventually there would be thousands and thousands of these little broken reeds, these little, little, little round pieces of sugar cane on the ground. And he said, I won't step on them. I won't crush them. The one who got the heart, his heart put in St. Francis, who one day when he was walking, uh, he almost stepped on a worm. And he was walking across the rock and he almost stepped on a worm and he got angry and he called together all the worms. He said, your worms come forth. As you don't walk across, you don't go across the rocks so that I might step on you. Be more careful. 
Make sure you're more careful. And the worms listened to him. Francis was so worried that he might step upon a worm. Where do all these things come from? Where does the spirit come from inside of man? It comes from his heart. What is it that makes a man different from the angels? It's his heart. It's his, what is it that makes him different from the animals? It's his mind. The animals have affections, but they don't have a mind. The angels have a mind, but they don't have and understand affections. And so we are greater than the angels in our hearts. We are greater than the animals in our minds. And we put the two together, and we are made in the image and likeness of God. Angels have a certain reflection of God, and animals have a certain reflection of God. But the angels have one half of God, and the animals and all non-living things have the other half of God. Only man is in the image and likeness of God. And hence, in order to be really like unto God, to be truly the sons of God, we are called the sons of God. The angels are not called the sons of God. A priest is called Alter Christus, another Christ. St. Michael is not an Alter Christus. So what is it that makes us so much envied by the devil, and so much hated by Satan and all his cohorts? What makes us of such interest to the angels? The angels see God face to face, and they understand oh, everything that there is to understand about the natural universe, and yet they are amazed at us. The movements of our hearts, that's what amazes the angels. It is our intellect that amazes the animals. It is our hearts that amaze the angels. And God is in both parts of us. He's in our minds and he's in our heart. Now in our age, there has been a denial of faith. And also, Christ has gone out of our hearts. And hence, oh, hence St. Margaret Mary Alacock, in the 1670s, over a little over 300 years ago, received the visions, many visions, from our Lord Jesus Christ. Then this devotion must be spread throughout the world. And then also, it was, it was revealed to that, uh, that in order to save the world from communism, to save the world from liberalism and modernism, to save the world from the wickedness that's in it now, there must be a devotion to the sacred heart. That is, we must not only know what is true, we must not only believe what is true against the heresies and the lies and behave like animals, but rather, this must be in our hearts, because this is the way that we combat and defeat Satan. If we only know truth, we shall not defeat Satan. We must love truth in order to defeat Satan. If we only do the externals of what is good, if we obey all the laws on the outside, but the love is not on the inside, we shall not go to heaven. This is the point of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is it that Devez, the rich man, burns in hell? Because the faith... The commandments were not in his heart. He went to the church every Saturday on the day of the Sabbath. He kept the Sabbath day holy. He obeyed all the laws of Moses. He, he was perfect on all external ways. He never murdered. He never raped. He never, he never robbed banks. He never violated taking the name of God in vain. He didn't worship false gods. You check all the Ten Commandments. And he has a check on every one of them. Yes, he obeyed the 10th, the 9th, the 8th, the 7th, the 6th, the 5th, the 4th, the 3 the 2 and the 1. And he is in hell. And why is he in hell? And don't fall, St. Augustine says, don't forget about those five foolish virgins. They were virgins. They were not impure. And behold, they came to the house in the middle of the night because they had forgot their oil and they had not enough oil. And when they returned back to the house, the door was locked. The bridegroom was already inside. And the bridegroom said to them, I know you not. I know you not. Who do we let in our house? You have many friends and neighbors. But who do you let in your house? Only those that are your loved ones. Only your loved ones go into the house. And if they are not the loved ones, they don't come into the house. And what is the trouble that we have in the world today? There are not loved ones. We don't have the love of God in our hearts. Therefore, it is most important to combat the modern world, not only with the knowledge of God, not only with the holy truth in our minds, but with the love of God in our hearts. There's a consideration here of the mystery of Absalom, we mentioned occasionally, 
the mystery of Absalom. Remember, Absalom was the son of David. And Absalom decided to betray his father. And he drove, he tried to kill his own father, and David had to flee. And then David eventually, through Joab, was able to regain his kingdom. And Absalom then had to flee. And the wicked Absalom fled, and David followed him, and then Joab followed him in battle. But David said to Joab, Absalom is fleeing. He has only a few soldiers with him. His days are over. But do not kill my son Absalom. But Joab did not listen. And when he finally found Absalom, got his hair caught up in a tree. He was had long hair, he was extremely handsome, most handsome man of Israel. And he was, he was, he, his hair got caught in a tree. It was long hair. He was hanging between the, the tree and the ground from an oak tree. And then Joab came by and killed him with three spears. Joab said that he told the soldiers, "Kill this man because he is an enemy of God, enemy of the king." And the soldiers said, "We will not kill him." Because we have heard the king in our own ears say to you and to all of us, Do not harm my son Absalom. Therefore we will not harm him. And Joab was angry, so he took a spear from one of his soldiers, and he threw it into the heart of Absalom. But Absalom was so strong that he stayed alive in the fullness of his strength. So then Joab grabbed a second spear, and he pierced Absalom's heart a second time. And Absalom was still in the fullness of his strength. And then Joab in anger grabbed a third spear, and with a third spear he pierced the heart of Absalom, and then Absalom finally died. But it took three spears to penetrate his heart. And the father of Revelier, 800 years ago, 700 years ago, a great Carthusian monk, said, Let us consider Absalom, for he tells us about the heart of Jesus, that heart that we must enter. Now let us abstract from Absalom's faults, because he was a wicked man. And he did turn against God and against the king. He was killed by Joab. But what is it? What are the similarities between him and our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, what can we learn from our Lord from Absalom concerning our Lord Jesus Christ? First, note this: that he was a king and the son of a king. He went to reign. David was his father, and David was the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he went to reign. And he had to flee in his reign. And when, when, he was, when, he was, when he was fleeing, he got captured upon a tree. And so Lord Jesus Christ also was captured upon a tree. And he hung from a tree. And Jesus Christ hung from a tree. He was the son of the king. He was the son of David. He was also the beloved of the people of Israel. And it said all of Israel followed him. And all of Israel loved him. They so loved Absalom. They loved him more than, than David. But then they turned against him. And they went and killed him. He was the beloved of Israel. As Jesus Christ on Palm Sunday was the beloved of Israel. Hail to the son of David. But then, shortly after his beloved of Israel, he ends up dead. And what was the result of his death, says of the Carthusian monk? It was the peace of Israel and the benefit of all his subjects. Because when Absalom was killed, when he was dead, peace entered the kingdom of David, and he would never have to fight again. He would never be insecure in his kingdom again. And it was all the his security of his kingdom and his peace until he died came from the death of Absalom. Absalom brought peace by his death. And if Absalom was alive, there would be no peace. If Absalom was alive, there could be no good for the subjects. And so it is with our king. Our Lord Jesus Christ, had he lived without being crucified, had he never gone to death for our sins, there would be no peace for us. There would be no happiness for our subjects. And how did he end his days? How did peace finally ensue? Because a spear penetrated his heart. Until the spear penetrated his heart, there was no peace. And so likewise, with the Lord Jesus Christ, a spear penetrated his heart. Now in that spear of, of Longinus, let us see three spears said the great Carthusian monk. There are three spears that penetrate the heart of Jesus Christ. One spear is not enough to kill him because of the strength of his heart. Two spears are not enough to kill him because of the strength of his heart. It takes three spears for him to finally expire and die. And hence there are three spears in the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. What was his agony when he hung up on the cross? And there were three agonies, three spears in his heart. And the first was the spear of his ignominious passion. He suffered from the passion, from being scourged and crowned with thorns, from being nailed to the cross. 
And the second spear was the anxiety of his heart because of the pain of his mother. Our Lord Jesus Christ suffers most greatly because he sees the pain of his mother. Imagine our Lord Jesus Christ hanging upon the cross, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is suffering and dying for our sins. But what does he see right before him? The sorrow of his mother. And this sorrow is a spear in his heart. Then the third spear of his heart is the spear of Judas. And he has spread his blood, he shed his blood, and he shed his blood for, for, for all of us. And yet the majority of souls are going to follow Judas. The majority of souls are going to imitate Judas, and they're going to betray him. And that betrayal does not bother Christ. He's not disturbed by their betrayal. Peter betrayed him. St. Mary Magdalene betrayed him. St. John was betrayed him. All of us betrayed him, and it doesn't bother him. He easily takes our betrayal. But what he cannot stand is the stubbornness of heart of those that refuse to repent and those that refer you to to turn back to him. And this is the third spear that finally kills his heart, the spear of Judas. And then there are three external spears, says Father Revelier. There are three external spears. Or remember what was said when the, he was a little child. The first thing that is said about him when he's a child by those that love him, Simeon speaks to the Blessed Mother. And what does, she, what does he say to her? This child shall be for the rise and fall of many. He shall be for the rise and fall of many in Israel. But thy own heart shall be pierced with a spear too. He speaks about the heart of Mary being pierced with a spear also. That this heart, this child, is going to have a heart pierced by a spear. And 33 years later, his heart was pierced by a spear. And 33 years later, the heart of his mother was pierced also by a spear. And their both hearts were pierced. And what was the result of the piercing of these hearts? The piercing of the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. The piercing of the heart of his Holy Mother. Opening the gates of heaven. Peace for all the subjects. The end of conflict and war. The end of all things evil. The destruction of the kingdom of Satan. The opening of the gates of heaven. Joy and peace comes to our heart because finally, he who was a sign of contradiction, he who was the one that caused all of our troubles, we blamed him. This child shall be for the rise and fall of many. And now he's dead. And now he's pierced with a spear. And there can be peace. Our Lord Jesus Christ died in the greatest of conflicts. So that we might have peace. Now three spears enter the heart of those who would achieve this peace. First, the spear that penetrated the heart of Mary, his mother. And secondly, the spear that penetrated the heart of St. John through the foot of the cross. And thirdly, the pierced the spear of St. Mary Magdalene. Those that love Jesus Christ, those who stand next to the cross and participate in the victory of the cross, they shall have a spear in their heart. And the first spear is the spear of the mother. Our Lord of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the second spear is the spear of St. John the Priest. In his priesthood, he receives a spear in his heart. And the third spear is Mary Magdalene, the repentant sinner who repented because of love. She did not repent because she was afraid of hell. She didn't repent because she of the misery that was in her life before. She repented because she loved Jesus Christ. She loved God. She loved the Father. She loved heaven. She loved those things that are infinitely good. And her heart turned away from all the loves. Her heart abandoned all the loves. She could no longer love lust. She could no longer love any pride. She could no longer love vanity. She could no longer love any sin. She loved him. And she lay prostrate at the foot of the cross. And she, she loved with such a great love. And when that spear penetrated the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, three spears came out. And one penetrated the heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who witnessed this. And the other, the heart of St. John, who received the heart of a priest when that spear penetrated his heart, and the heart of Mary Magdalene. These hearts open up peace in our world. They open up the divine love. We must have a great love of our Lord Jesus Christ in his most sacred heart. And it was given to us that we should consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And what goes to the Immaculate Heart? The Sacred Heart. One can never receive the Immaculate Heart without the Sacred Heart. The battle is the battle of the heart. We are in a great war against the enemies of God. They know the truth, and we know the truth. The minds know clearly which way is up and which way is down. But where is the battle to be fought? In the realm and the battlefield of the heart. So let us fight the battle inside the heart. 
and we have, 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 have a great devotion to the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every family should be consecrated to the sacred heart. And each day at the evening meal, renew their prayer of consecrating their family to the sacred heart. Encourage others to do the same thing. And they'll recognize that by the devotion to this most sacred heart, we will be able to conquer our enemies who are the enemies of God. And they will be our enemies because we are the friends of God. There are many times when we say, I don't like evil people, but in fact we like them quite well because they give us what we want. But if we love God, and if we really have the love of God in our hearts, then these people who will really be our enemies, and those that are really against God will really be our enemies, and we'll be able to fight against them with success in a great battle. So in any case, the first we're in the battle of our battle of the faith, yes, keep the truth in our minds, but there must be a great love and devotion to the most sacred heart of Jesus. When Garcia Moreno consecrated Ecuador to the sacred heart, he saved the country. He saved the country. And, God, and, and also Our Lady said in, in, in 1689, you must consecrate France to the sacred heart of Jesus. But the king refused. He would not consecrate France to the sacred heart of Jesus. And therefore, 100 years later, came the French Revolution and the destruction of France as a punishment for not consecrating that country to the sacred heart. Ecuador was saved by its consecration of the sacred heart. France was condemned because it did not consecrate the sacred heart. And we must, in the 20th century, it was consecrated by the sacred, to the sacred heart in a special way by Pope Leo XIII. We must, con we must be consecrated to the sacred heart as a means to fight error successfully, to fight heresy and sin successfully by the love of the sacred heart. Let's enter into the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. Longinus with the most wicked spear penetrated the heart. But out came blood and water, and he that saw believed, and his testimony is true. The testimony of Longinus converts souls. The testimony of Caiaphas does not. The testimony of Judas does not. The testimony of the others does not. But the testimony of Longinus, it converts souls. For he saw, and his testimony is true. And we know that Jesus Christ is really dead because Longinus made sure that he was really dead. And we know that he really rose from the dead. And that his heart did conquer death and conquer sin. And the prophecy that was made by Simeon 33 years before that spear pierced his heart became true. His heart was pierced. And the Blessed Virgin Mary's heart was pierced. And St. John's heart was pierced. And Mary Magdalene's heart was pierced. And from these piercings comes our salvation. Comes our hope. And so in any case, there is no peace without a ride of the cross. There's no joy and there's no peace in our hearts unless the spear finally penetrates and the spear opens up. Whatever is bad in our hearts will fall out. Whatever is good will, 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 spread, will spread out and cause blessings to all souls around us. So let's pray that we persevere through a few wounds of the heart and imitate our Lord Jesus Christ in his most sacred heart. And may the heart of Christ be in us and with us all the way until our dying days. Let's go bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.